Greetings. The title of my message today is A Christ-like Congregation, and my text comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Now, by way of uh, introduction, I want to remind you of a couple of points that I made last week, and that is that the Christ-following lifestyle is a, um, a series of choices that we make daily. Now, some of these choices relate to some major issues in our lives, and others relate to what we would consider to be um, seemingly uh, trivial or uh, unimportant issues in life. But all choices are important to God because he cares about all of our choices, every one of them. Now, we talked about the fact that our choices also have consequences, both now in this life and for eternity. And all choices are ultimately personal, individual choices. We will all have to stand before Jesus and give an account for our choices. The second truth uh, comes from uh, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, when Jeremiah the prophet was called by God to go and speak to the southern kingdom uh, of Judah. And he said to them, in, on behalf of God, stand at the crossroads and look, and ask for the ancient ways, ask for the good way, and then walk in it. Well, as we ended last uh, Sunday, uh, I said that we as a congregation, stand at a crossroads. The truth is, we all stand at a crossroads every day because we get to make those choices. But particularly uh, right now in, uh, for our church, and God tells us to choose to walk in the ancient paths, the good way. And why would he say that? Because God's way is the ancient way. He established that way before he ever established creation. He, it's based on his nature. He will never change in his nature. Therefore, his way never changes. Therefore, ancient ways are his ways. God shows us the good way through the example of Jesus while he was here walking on the earth. And we learn the good way from God's Word, the Bible. The good way is based on his holy, perfect, unchanging nature. Well, our choice then is between obeying and walking according to his way or going our own way. And like we've said, all of our other choices, this choice has a consequence. Blessing, the peace of Christ, his guidance come with going the ancient way, his way. Or loss of God's peace, his presence in our life, his guidance, if we choose to go our own way. Because God never, ever blesses disobedience. Now, it seems to me that we are standing uh, at that crossroads. And as a congregation, we cannot afford to lose God's blessing and guidance because then we will never be the kind of congregation that he desires us to be. We need his presence and his power through the Holy Spirit or we're just uh, beating the drum. <laughs> we're just marking time. So what kind of congregation does God want us to be? Well, there are a zillion ways that I could answer that question for you, of course. But since I intended to be in Colossians 3 last week, and then God moved me in a different direction, let's do that today. Because in this passage, Paul describes what a Christ-like congregation looks like and what it does. This is what we should strive to do and to be as a church family. We want to reflect before our community the blessings of what it means to be part of God's family. 
I mean, we say that God is the only way to have lasting peace. That's what we believe. The only way to have true joy, contentment, and a sense of meaning and purpose in life. So if that is true, then we ought to live like that. Yes, no. I mean, it just makes sense. We choose to live our lives individually and collectively as a congregation as a means of demonstrating what it means to be a part of the family of God. Therefore, we would be a we need to be a Christ-like congregation. We need to show that being a Christian is real. It changes people. And there are real, measurable, tangible blessings and benefits to be had um, for being part of God's family. And our lives should show that. So as we come to Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, we see that Paul describes this type of congregation as he writes these people. And he's writing in very practical terms. In verse 12, he begins with the word, therefore. And perhaps you know or have heard me say, but since, um, well, for many decades actually, but since, certainly since I've been here, I've always insisted that if you find the word therefore in the New Testament, or actually in the Bible anywhere, but you'll find it mostly in the New Testament, you should stop and you ask yourself, well, why is that word there for? Why is it there? Now, in worship today, uh, Wanda would have read verses 1 through 10. So if you're watching this uh, video, I would in, uh, ask you, and I'll probably put it in the description, for you to read verses 1 through 10 of chapter 3. But in those verses, Paul is going to show us the foundation, the basis for the life that we are to lead, uh, both individually and collectively, um, as Christians. And Paul gives us some very specific detailed and practical instructions as to how we are to live and from that we can determine why but remember that becoming like Jesus we've talked about for several weeks requires our uh, active participation we must uh, cooperate with God and uh, his working in our lives to make us be like Jesus it's a supernatural process you can't do it on your own well, in verses 5 through 10, you'll see that Paul begins to use a metaphor of clothing. He first says to take off certain things, verses 5 through 9. And what he lists there, as you'll see, Paul loves to make lists, he's talking about sins in our lives before we became identified as having uh, made the decision to be part of Christ's family. That he would say being in Christ. We would say being a Christian. Then in verse 10, he says that we're to put on certain things. First, put off. Now, 10, he says, put off. Uh, excuse me, put on. And he says that we are continually learning more and more about what is right. And then trying constantly to be more and more like Jesus. Those are the things we're to put on. In verse 11, we looked at a couple of weeks ago, um, and I find that verse such a powerful and instructive verse for us in the 21st century. He writes these words, In this new life, the new life in Jesus, being a Christ follower, one's nationality, one's race, education, or social standing is not important. Such things mean nothing. Whether a person has Christ is what matters. And he is equally available to all. It all starts with our choice to become part of the family of God through faith in what Jesus did and nothing else. That's where the Christian life starts. So in verse 12, we see that word, therefore, because we have done or should have done all that Paul has instructed us to do uh, from verse 1 of chapter 3. And the truth is, if you think about it, we do those things daily. Uh, we put off harmful things and we choose to put on godly things. So now we're all set to live uh, this new life in Jesus. 
becoming increasingly like Jesus. Paul continues this uh, metaphor. Um, he uses this in other letters. He likes this. Um, about clothing in verses 12 through 14. Let me read that for you. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Paul writes. These words were used to describe uh, the Jewish people back in Deuteronomy and uh, uh, deep in the Old Testament. But Paul is now using them to the letter uh, to this ch church in uh, Colossae. He's writing about a church, a New Testament church, the church now. Notice how we have emphasized all through this series of the main things, uh, how much God loves his children. This shows it here. Paul demonstrates that. God loves his children and his church. He describes us as holy. So it struck me to ask, do you feel holy? What does holy mean? Well, holy means that you are set apart by God for God because we have been raised with Christ, as he says in verse 1. That's how God sees us. When he sees us, he sees that we are in Jesus, and therefore we are holy. Well, in that passage that I just read for you, I, I don't want the word chosen uh, to throw you. Some people use it in a theological sense, uh, and I think somewhat incorrectly. Um, that's another sermon. But Israel was originally chosen to be the vehicle by which God would reach the pagan nations around them because they were just equally made in his image. And the Jewish people were to be witnesses of that fact. But Israel uh, not only missed their Messiah because they abandoned their scriptures, they missed their mandate to fulfill God's purpose for them, reaching people who were made in God's image. So now the church in our day and age has been assigned that task, and we see that in Matthew chapter 28 and in the Gospel of Luke. Go into all the world and make disciples. So we are chosen to be holy and to teach others how to be holy, set apart to God in Jesus, through faith in Jesus. But what I really want you to see is the instructions that come next. He tells us how to be a, a Christ-like congregation and what that looks like. As a Christ-like congregation, we are to clothe ourselves, he says, with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Being forgiving, and loving. Do you see those qualities in yourself? Do you see them in the church in which you uh, go? Well, who does that really sound like? It sounds like Jesus. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22, the, the fruits of the Spirit. It sounds like Jesus. These are the qualities of being like Jesus. And we need to demonstrate them through our lives to other people, before God and others, in the way we live. Well, I want to pinpoint a, a little, make a point, I, I should say, on, on that comment that he, uh, the phrase he uses, to put on. Uh, because in the Greek, um, the way the phrase uh, is constructed we don't see it in English, right? You, you, you don't get this. But in Greek, the way Paul writes that is, uh, denotes a real strong sense of urgency. And I would ask, why? And simply, the answer is because they are the qualities of Jesus. We are to be like Jesus. 
And there's an urgency about that. We don't just mamby-pamby live the Christian life. You know, it, it takes work, discipline, and, and God pays attention. And here Paul is saying on God's behalf, there should be a sense of urgency that we change to be like Jesus. We are witnesses of what it means to be part of the family of God in very real, practical terms. So Paul is making that a top priority. Put on those qualities, both individually, and then we can demonstrate it through uh, the group activity in a church family dramatically because we express them as uh, collectively as a congregation, God's family, where we worship. Well, let me read for you verses uh, 15 through 18. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, in our day we'd say hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, listen to this, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Well, let me emphasize these points. These are qualities that Paul lists that are of Jesus and his nature. We are to imitate them. We develop them in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit and his presence in our lives, which only comes to those who are genuinely part of his family through faith in Christ. We're to develop them individually and practice them both individually and corporately uh, as a witness to those around us in the world, what it means to be part of the family of God. You see, we have the peace of Jesus. And people can't get that anywhere else. And they are searching for peace in all the wrong places. They should see it in us. And this is how we are to build the kingdom, fulfill that mission that God gave us for building his kingdom, building our church by being like Jesus. Our purpose is to draw people to a relationship with God through the qualities that, are, uh, that we demonstrate as a congregation or as individuals. Because we have what the world needs. We have what people want. We have peace with God and with each other and these other qualities that Paul lists for us. That's what a Christ-like congregation is to be and to do. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the clarity and the um, detail that we see in your word that teaches us why, the foundation, who we are, and then how we are to live and what we're to do with these qualities of being like your son, Jesus. We're to share them and we are to invite others to improve their life and obviously their eternity. So thank you for the truth of your word, Father, in Jesus' name. Have a great week.